<laughs> All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, we are welcoming Fanny from Karaf. Hi, Fanny. Nice to see you. Hi. Nice to be here. And then we have Sylvan representing the DSL collection. Hi, Sylvan. Thank you for Hello. joining this panel. And Boris Magrini from Hack Basel. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thanks for inviting. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for being here today. We are going to be discussing gamification in arts, which is such a great topic, which is definitely part of the Karaf experience. So to start with, I would like to address the question of what does gamifying art mean to you in a more broad sense, you know, from a curatorial point of view, but also from uh, a collection and a fair point of view. So the first question for all of you is, what does it mean to gamifying art? And maybe we can start from Fanny. Thank you. I like the women first, <laughs> my feminist side. Um, so it's, I mean, gamification. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a broad question. So I'll, I'll try to be to be uh, focused on on a few aspects because um, for for me, whenever you try to uh, address a large audience and uh, access more people than a, than a small niche, this is something that a lot of other industries have used uh, to uh, really interest people first, uh, because I think this is something that we sometimes forget with the art market. We always talk about VIPs and very important people, high net worth individual, but there are still people who like to be entertained. And, um, and I will always remember working for Collectrium before, every time we were trying to add something a little fun, um, it was like, no, 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 we can't. Uh, these people have like, you know, this is, it has to be gray and white, this is it. And at the end of the day, it became like really, everything looks the same. Everything is like, um, you know, for these tools, they're like very bland. Um, so I, I think this is like, we have to remember that we're still talking to people, even if they're VIPs, and they like to be entertained. And uh, with gamification, we we can reach more people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you know, Boris, what does that mean to you in terms of curating arts within a gallery environment? What does gamification in art means? Well, when I when I hear the, the word gamification of art, I think about two things. Huh? One would be the process of making art more uh, playful for in order to uh, engage a, a wider audience. So this would be for me a kind of um, almost, um, I wouldn't say negative uh, approach uh, because it is not, but I, um, it would certainly be, um, I would consider it as a, as a commercial or a communication strategy, right? So how do we make art more appealing to the masses, which is not, um, something negative per se, but it's not something that I would be uh, absolutely interested to discuss. But I, I, I would also think that gamification of art could could be um, the process uh, in which artists use game uh, technology, gaming technology, or game gaming strategies or gaming softwares to produce art. And in this way, it's something that uh, um, I find much more interesting to engage with. And this is something also that uh, speaks to me and I found fascinating. There are, there are a lot of artists today um, working with games, um, either by hacking games. I mean, it is something that has already started many years ago, but it's a process that I see it's very present nowadays. Um, I'm currently working on an exhibition that uh, we'll, we will show at Hack next year on exactly on this topic. So I see these two, uh, these two uh, definition of, of the uh, of the word gaming gamification of art. Although I wouldn't probably use that word. If you have any other suggestion, I think we'll be very happy to discuss which one this could be. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, you've touched on a very important topic, which is: Are we using games to create an experience that is actually mm -hmm. coming from the technology and softwares that we use to create? Or do we use such technologies to reach a global audience? And I think this will be an interesting question to address to Sylvain, since the DSL collection is very much tuned in with what is happening uh, within the uh, technological uh, sphere. So Sylvain, how is the DSL collection approaching the gamification of art? First, I would like to say that uh, uh, 
gamification of art is a very touchy subject. Because for most of the people, and I was on the panel last week, or two weeks ago, and I spoke about video games, and I had a, a very uh, strong reaction of one of the panelists telling me that it was about commodification of art. So I, I would like to put into context a little bit, for me, what is gamification of art? Mm -hmm. First, gamification of art has not begun with the digital. It has begun by, you know, by installation in, in places, you know. When you see uh, the Turbine Hall, when you see Team Lab, when you see uh, Kusama, it's already a, a gamification of art. And if you look at the numbers, uh, there was a survey in 2017 on a number on why people go to museum. 71% of the people for culture track was for amusement, to have fun. Mm -hmm. So I think that art and, and I should say, edutainment, education and entertainment is something very, very, very close. But for a certain number of people, going to, into this direction is to question the purity of what is an artwork. So this is the context in which we have been working with VSL. The other thing is that for me, gamification is about opening a new type of space. Like VR is a new type of space. Like, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, we, Second Life was a new type of space. Mm -hmm. I think gamification is a new type of space. Mm -hmm. And in this space, what we are trying to reach with this space, first, I think like uh, Boris said, and uh, in, in, in a very uh, right way, uh, gamification is, is the use of techniques on how to make a screen uh, very interactive, emotional, and also scalable. And I think this is very important, is to be capable with this tool to reach, I should say, another type of experience and another type of people. And the other thing which is very important for us is also today, if you look at numbers, Fortnite, they have 250 million people playing on Fortnite and you just have a few millions going to visit museums. So I think it's, it's very important to try to reach a new type of audience, at least to try to reach by using this tool. So this is why. We've been now engaged for uh, a video game. We're going to have a video game at the end of the year. Uh, we are working very hard on that. Uh, and I'm very in I would be very interested to see uh, the, the result of this game uh, by the end of the year. Thank you so Just much. To, uh, if I can add something to what Sylvain said, oh. sorry to interrupt, uh, Serena, but this is uh, um, what you said very true. This is very controversial when you talk about video games uh, and, you know, like it's like the artist is selling their soul to the devil if they work on a video game. Uh, what I've been very appreciative working more in digital art um, uh, is, uh, and we talked about that, Serena, last week, but it's like more the bridges between uh, art and uh, and gaming. And, and And this is kind of where um, they are amazing. I mean, artists come from very more various background in digital arts, so like scientists, uh, developers, uh, biologists, um, but a lot of gamers and or graphic designers. And um, and 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 this is where, um, yes, gaming is a huge industry, as you said, Sylvain. And 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 it's like they're gonna find jobs in that industry. And, and is it commodification? Is it like just making a living? Um, and, and more and more the fact that like, it's not just making a living, but they are amazing piece of art. There are stills, they are like drawings to prepare um, and that is coming back into the art market, which is really, for me, very, very interesting. I would also like to add that in the gaming, we are talking, what I was talking and what Sylvain, you were talking about, it's also about artists using games to make art, right? Uh, in a thousand different ways, thousand different approaches. But there are also video games made as video games that are extremely creative, extremely um, also intellectual, also alternative in the way they are produced. There are uh, such a sub niche and many sub genre. I mean, you mentioned Fortnite, which is a blockbuster, but uh, there are many, many video games that are created without the potential of making art, but are extremely interesting as from an intellectual point of view. So it's a huge, uh, it's a huge uh, field to, to discover, of course. 
you know, yes, but, but you know, but for us, we 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 do a, a little bit the same process every time. For instance, with VR, we have commissioned works using VR as a medium, mm -hmm. but we also made a VR museum where people could experience our collection by using VR. Mm -hmm. And I think we will do the same thing with uh, with video games. Mm -hmm. There will be a space where people will be able to connect with the works of the collection and uh, with a new type of experience, but also there will be also a video game where we will ask an artist to, to really uh, use video game. But you know, video game, for instance, I gave you a name, Fang Mengbo was it? I know, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Fang Mengbo, we have collected his work, his first mm -hmm. work. So, you know, we have already collected video games by artists. Absolutely, that's great, <laughs> and yeah. But what will be interesting to see in 2020, what an artist will do in the video game, but already we have video games in, in the collection. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, uh, that's, these are very great topics. And something that Sylvain touched upon is the fact that we are always somehow looking for experiences that are engaging. And, you know, you've also mentioned about scalability and the fact that the education, so the learning process, and the fun aspect should somehow be consistent in these experiences. Um, so I would like also to address that. How can we somehow keep these experiences as engaging as possible since we are translating from the IRL environment into the URL environment? How can we still keep the engagement part possible since we are losing partially the physicality of the space? Is that something that it is possible to replicate? Maybe Boris, this one it could be for you since you have a curatorial background. Um, of course, this is a challenge. Um, every time you organize an exhibition um, and you open an exhibition in a physical space, it's always a challenge how to, how to present digital works, right? Because uh, we have some uh, very uh, known strategies, uh, video projection, um, VR headsets, uh, uh, a screen with some, uh, in the case of an interactive uh, work, such as an interactive video game, uh, you have the joystick or whatever, the controllers. Um, but then there is also the question of the public around, because very often these interactive pieces um, are very personal. So there's one person at a time. So how do you engage the audience that is waiting to experience the piece? Uh, and how do you provide also a sensible experience that it's in interesting? And I think there are no rules. Uh, again, you know, I think it's a discussion with the, uh, with the artist, how to present his or her work in the best way, uh, what makes sense for him or for her. Um, and very often the artists themselves are very much aware of this problem and, uh, and, and they already come up with some solutions that are extremely interesting. How to, uh, they can be very radical or they can be also very creative. I don't know, uh, think about Bans and Bobinkel, a German couple who works also with the virtual reality and interactive virtual reality pieces. Uh, they think about the setup in a, in a very creative way that matches somehow the aesthetic of the virtual environment. In the case of a purely uh, digital exhibition, I know, Sylvain, you, you also have an exhibition, a, digital, a, a virtual exhibition on your website, um, very interesting. Uh, that's a challenge again. Uh, do we mimic a physical space uh, to give the impression as in Second Life, for example, the experiment that have been done to create exhibition on Second Life? Or do we go for a purely... Um, I mean, I think there, there is room for experimentation. I think there is possibility to, to go beyond the simple uh, mimicking of the real space within the virtual space. And again, I don't think there are rules. I think, uh, I think there is a, a room for experimentation and to discover and to let uh, and to engage with the dialogue with the arts, how they see it, how they, how they want it, uh, what can be done, what can be done wrong, what can be done in a crazy way that surprises the audience as well. Uh, I think uh, this is a key you know, to this, this freedom of expression and the possibilities. Very much so. And um, there's a research that is currently ongoing alongside the USL uh, University here in London, where they clearly state that the impact of the environment has a way of processing the way we learn. And so how, for example, we set up an exhibition and how we uh, move within that space. So thinking about space and aesthetics, which are elements embedded within the IRL, um, I was thinking, and this is probably for funny to answer since Gaddafi, it's one of the very first art fair, which is fully going online. 
how do you feel the fair, for example, in responding to the fact that the aesthetic and the dynamic of the space may vary, given that it doesn't really replicate or emulate the actual physicality of a space, but is fully digitally born? Yeah, uh, well, that's kind of why we called it an experiment. To be honest, we had no idea how people would react because that's the first time uh, we've done it. And uh, to give some background, we never intended to be fully digital. Um, we really started with um, a, a real life community to build, you know, trust, like, and 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 say we're here to stay. We're not here to make the quick buck and and leave because. The last thing you want in the art market, and I think we all agree on that, is to be the you know new startup who's going to disappear in two months. Um, and for me, it was like really about um, telling the story of these artworks to people, like you know, bring like taking the hand, going through the exhibit, and telling a story. Um, the reason why we just did not go for just a website, uh, there are a few reasons for that, and I'm love to discuss the VR aspect with Sylvain because. <laughs> We, I think we disagree on, on, on that end, but uh, I'll keep that for, for in a few minutes. Um, we, uh, we looked around, we looked at like different platform, we looked at just having like an, an website and said, let's, let's wait a minute. Like there are a lot of, um, of online viewing rooms that just um, like, you know, it's just a website pretty much. So you're missing a few aspects from that we love uh, going to fairs uh, is the fact that it's an event where you have a lot of people. It's a social event. So uh, you can see that there are more people. I mean, when you're on the website, you're literally by yourself and being quarantined and being by yourself in front of the computer sucks. So we said, okay, like how can we uh, do that without uh, trying, as you said, Boris, like mimicking, um, you know, like the um, the IRL like uh, situation. For example, I always give the example of the bench uh, in uh, on Art Basel viewing room. It's a stupid bench. I'm sorry, but it's like I can't sit on the bench, and it's an ugly bench. Why do you put a bench in front of me? Fine, it's for the 3D aspect. I'm just playing the devil's advocate, but. Um, but so we, we try to find like digital native ways uh, of uh, like the feelings and, 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 and the results that we wanted, not mimic uh, what could have been in, uh, in real life. And so, for example, like the social aspect and the synchronous aspect of an event uh, is with seeing the people that are um, uh, in the event with uh, the general chat. Uh, with more uh, intimate interactions, with one-on-one -on -one chat between the exhibitor and a potential buyer, uh, a chat per booth because say, as you would go to a booth, like you would, you know, like talk to people around you, um, and and so on and so forth. I think they were like really um, the idea, um, and it's not easy. I mean, you know, like it's like I have stuff to do. Like I'm not always in front of the computer, uh, and 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 we're not going to be able to reproduce everything, you know, it's like mm -hmm. that we had IRL, but I think there are more, there are other things that uh, uh, appear that are actually truly interesting. Uh, for example, like for introvert people, it's easier to interact with galleries, with uh, people that they would like, oh, like such an important person, like I'm a little shy. Um, also from, um, I lost my train of thoughts. It's very early here. <laughs> um, anyway, so so this is kind of where uh, where we started. But um, um, and and having, I would love to hear from Sylvain, like on uh, why you chose VR as an exhibition space, um, because we really we went against it uh, for uh, for Kadaf. Um, yeah, so I'm not gonna say more. <laughs> Let's see. The same topic, which definitely we're gonna pass on to Sylvain to to respond. In a way, what you for me highlighted is that um, there are elements that we've also described at the very beginning of this talk, which are the engagement part, the fun part, the fact that you like to experience art together. Um, even though the online space it may allow people with different abilities to experience art in a more friendly way. Possibly. And this is something that it can be explored even more. Um, but Sylvain, for you, how did you find the engagement towards the, the DSL collection 
uh, when this was exhibited within a physical space and a virtual space? What are the differences and opportunities that you found by exhibiting in a VR environment, for example? It's a, it, 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 it's a long question it, uh, because it's, uh, uh, it, it's about the, uh, the DNA of the collection. From the beginning, we have decided to have a nomadic collection. Uh, very simply, why? Because we think that in terms of some sustainability, we cannot afford a physical space. Either the building, either managing a physical space was very difficult. And in 2005, it happens that it was YouTube, and uh, it inspires us to, uh, to to look at the the internet to share the collection. And so from this time, we surfed on the digital wave, and we discovered that this wave was opening new types of experiences and new types of uh, of of I should say audiences. But we we never tried to replicate never tried to replicate the white cube. What is interesting for us is that all this technology has to serve art and to bring new, new, new experiences. This is a vision from the beginning. And so this vision took us from internet to second life, second life to uh, now VR and VR to video game and tomorrow it can be all over and whatever. So yeah. it's a vision. Coming back to what you said, I think that's we have also to, to, to look at things. A part of art, a part of the visual art, if you look at the rest of the culture, and art is part of culture, and culture is part of the leisure industry. If you look at, the, for instance, the music industry, people go to concerts, but people discover also music through video, video game, video okay. tube on YouTube and much more than in concert and people have the streaming. And the same thing with all types of cultural goods. It's the same thing with cinema. It's the same thing now with uh, newspapers. It's the same thing with books. So the digital experience has always, I shall say, widen the audience of a culture experience and has not replaced another one. So I think this is very, very important is that not always to try to, to put yourself in the position where you are fighting against the in-person uh, experience. We are not fighting in, against the in-person. We learn a lot of works. We are always every weekend in museum. But I think that we have to push the boundaries, especially to push the boundaries with the winds of changes. We live in 2020 and we cannot look at 2020 like we should have looked at art 50 years ago. So, but how you make it relevant, that's another question. That's another question. So for me, it's just a vision and we'll try to apply this vision slowly and slowly when we think that it's technology which serves art and not on the contrary. This is how we, we've been to VR. And if you want to speak of the VR, just a few words. Uh, for me, VR, uh, personally, I think it's a game changer. Because till today, you are looking at a screen, a cinema, a computer, whatever, a, an iPhone screen. With VR, it's about interactivity and immersion. So you bring totally a new experience inside and you don't have physical constraint. But you know, we have to wait that the content and the hardware become more friendly and more uh, disseminated. But I believe that VR is an important way to experience art. I would like to react quickly to, to what you said. I think it's very oh, important. Yeah. That I was going to actually address that to you now, uh, Boris, and ask you how, how VR has been proving if you've tested that within your gallery space and what kind of engagement you had. Of course. I mean, we, we also invest. We, we had a, a, a show in 2017, The Unframed World, that was um, a, a, 
uh, an exhibition about VR because, of course, uh, about artists using VR because, of course, uh, VR it's a, it's an old uh, uh, technology in a way. I mean, they already started in the 50s and then uh, again in the 80s to experiment with VR. But it's only recently, Sylvain, you mentioned the hardware advances that uh, VR managed to to really create. I mean, with HTC Vive and Oculus Rift and Google Cardboard, that that really VR break into mainstream and and artists were allowed to 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 use these technologies and um it was an exhibition curated by tina sauerlander who is also a, a curator who uh, who is very much involved in berlin in the digital uh, field and and especially specialized in vr and it was a, a first attempt to have a kind of encompassing exhibition with artists working with vr of course it was a selection of all, only a, a dozen artists but nonetheless it was interesting and we learned a lot um, also with this exhibition how to engage with the audience uh, this problem of um, exhibiting works of VR in which you have only one or two person at a time being able to experience the work. Um, uh, as we invested in hardware we, we, for VR because we knew it was uh, something that we would continuously use and, it, and it's the case every exhibition that we present today has very often one or two VR pieces. So, um, and, and, and we have to update, uh, our technician had to learn uh, to deal with this technology. So it, it brings a lot of challenges, but it's exciting. And I think I agree absolutely with you, Sylvain. It is something um, that it's happening and it will continue to grow. Um, of course, as every technology, it will evolve. Uh, we don't know where, uh, but we have to keep up and, uh, and see. And it is exciting because there is already a lot of interesting content. Uh, not only from a commercial point of view, I mean, the, there's thousands of uh, video and interactive uh, works and, and video games, maybe not so much yet, but quite quite a few. Uh, but also artists, a lot, a lot of artists use VR more and more uh, everywhere. In And and this is something that, uh, and they create amazing pieces. Um, and I think that the pieces that are the most surprising and interesting for me are the pieces that are uh, surprising in the way they, uh, subvert somehow the expectation of what you are um, uh, meant to see or to experience in a VR environment. That's what that's what excites me actually. But I want just to add just very quickly, Sylvain, uh, you mentioned that uh, um, YouTube and uh, uh, the process of uh, people seeking pleasure. Absolutely, I agree with you. We have to be aware of that and and the new channels where the people get information, where the people get the entertainment. Uh, needs to be uh, we need to be aware of them. I would add maybe just a little a little note in saying that um, it is important to be updated. It is important to follow these trends, but it is also important not to let these trends dictate also completely what should happen in the art world. I think we artists should should still be able to have a critical uh, point of view and and be able also to not uh, completely be um, overwhelmed by the, by the necessity to engage with the largest amount of ed audience. Sometimes it sounds okay uh, not to engage with everyone, I mm. think. <laughs> Can I just That's a fair add? point. Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, I, I do agree with you. We should never, you know, uh, sell our soul to the devil. Uh, but, you know, it's always interesting also to try to, to open new doors and I shall not say to democratize art, but to bring art to as many people as we can. Um, but I want to say something very interesting about, and it will come as, it will come back to gamification in a certain way. First, uh, wh what we have taken out of, takeaways of our experience of VR. Two things. The first thing is that uh, with VR, we can reach the missing audience. Uh, the old people who cannot move very easily, with a mask tomorrow, they will be able to go to Shanghai, New York, or, or, or Paris to see an exhibition or to listen to a concert. So this is something very important. The other thing is that also we are we reach the another type of missing audience, what the young people, because with VR, was it, it's like a game, and we made three versions of our museum, and the last version was a gamification version of the museum. Because when you play the last version, you are capable to take a, a sculpture of six meters high and throw it away. And so the children were capable to play with these installations. And this is also was a way to move to video games. 
It means that what we have learned from the VR experience, which means scalability, trying to reach more audience, also bringing into the game into a uh, into something an art experience, what I shall call to be seriously fun, was something which also brought us a step ahead, a step forward, and to look at video games. Can I can I add something um, on that? I think first it's very timely to throw away you know statues and and, and sculptures. So um, so I, I I will try that uh, because Sylvain I. I, I I now have my first VR headset, so I'm, I'm part of the future now. <laughs> um, just quickly going back to like what you both said, I, I think this for me there's also, there's two uses of VR. Obviously, there's like the um, the VR as like a, a, a new exhibition space uh, where you can go somewhere and see something, which would be like I don't know another VR art piece or like you know like a, a traditional uh, uh, painting, which accessibility wise. Is incredible and um, and but still, I would say that like for me, we're still in its in the infancy of uh, the capabilities uh, and um, and it's absolutely a game changer. Like VR, like I do agree on that part with you because um, are you familiar with this company, Superhuman X? Uh, it's it's more of a health and uh, and 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 study on how VR tricks your brain and has a real direct impact and connection by removing the space that you have between the screen and uh, and, and and your eyes, um, and um, and that's what is very interesting to me. It's like this like closeness and like and and what an artist can do with that and. Um, and I think right now we're actually missing a lot of curators and people telling the stories of, of these great pieces of art. And I know, Sylvain, your collection has uh, very like mind-blowing uh, pieces of VR, but I, like for me, this is really the next step of like telling the story of this uh, of this uh, piece of art. And 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 all the other applications really because I don't I think VR is still like very much like oh it's a gaming thing like I don't really you know it's a Sony showroom uh, type of thing but uh, it's mind blowing mind blowing and 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 with the uh, um, effects it can have on braid it could be revolutionary um, however for the art exhibition spaces uh, I'm like I don't know I I I'm really First, it's a, it's it's you're limiting yourself to the people who have a VR headset, right? So, uh, so it's fine if uh, Boris, if you have them in your gallery, like you're like curating the experience. But when you're absolutely just online, that's where like yes, artists should not reach out like to many people. Art, um, you know, fairs and institutions. I think that's the goal of like reaching more people. I mean, this is why we tell the stories of all of these artists is to. Um, to help them also reach out a bigger audience, and and I looked at the VR, um, um, I don't know, not software platforms uh, who don't require this VR headset. It's very under, um, you know, under. I mean, I was very under impressed. So I don't know, Sylvain, if you like looked at uh, at the things that don't require the VR headset, but no. um, funny. Sorry uh, to interrupt you. I think that. No, no, no. We, we have today, uh, we are in front of, of very important issues. Uh, that's why I think that uh, uh, 2020 will not be just a, a nanu, anis already, but it will be a changing of era. Yeah. Uh, I think that till today, uh, the um, one of the metrics of success of the museum was to have as many people as they can. It was about numbers. And we know that today it, it's no more possible. For many reasons, it's no more possible to have this metric of success. The only way to have metrics of success in a certain way is to take into account the digital visitors. And more and more museums today will go into digital and they will have also a digital visitor metrics of success. And this will make them work on the content. And this can also change the whole model of the museums. Mm -hmm. Because for me today, 
there is no museum who can survive at the without yeah. funds. But if we go into a kind of digital distribution, a kind of freemium, freemium model, where, for instance, you can visit three rooms of the Louvre, and if you want to visit the rest of the Louvre, you pay $10, and you have a curator who explains you. You can have millions of people paying $10, and it can change the balance. Yeah. Much more people than visiting people. And I think that's the, the future for me. That's why I'm interested in those new spaces like, like video games or, 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 or VR, is because I think we have to expand the audience in order to make the physical stay alive. Because this is the issue today, is how we can make the physical stay alive and not the digital to replace the physical. And I think that the digital can help to make the physical stay alive, like it has done for the music, like it has done for the cinema, and like it has done for the newspaper. So this is my vision that I would like to apply through the collection. It's the idea of trying to find a solution for the question of sustainability for, uh, I shall say, institution, cultural institutions. But it's it's still very sorry sorry Maurice, but it's it's, uh, it's still very I mean I, I I think I mean and right now we we have all adapted from all all in person to all digital uh, and of course it's not going to stay all digital I mean I hope not um, because uh, but but the hybrid version of what you're uh, saying and I love your comparison with um, with uh, movies and uh, and music um, but with art more in general not just maybe digital art like it's still this hybrid version like it's still very hard to define and obviously i don't think we've cracked the code on that one and and i mean it's it's still i i can't plan the future but it's it's uh for me this is what like you know okay fine we passed like we adapted like somehow to only online but how do we elegantly come back to um, uh, an in-person exhi uh, exhibition and uh, and that might be the silver lining of COVID-19 is like how do you go back to a physical exhibition with a better technology because I would hate that we just go back to um, you know like forget everything that happened in the quarantine go back to just like physical exhibitions and then just have a crappy website next to it because then we lose all these ideas and 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 improvement that we've done in accessibility and uh, um, and telling the story differently. Um, so that's my hope for the future. <laughs> I like how you both address those issues. And uh, during a conversation I had prior to this panel with uh, Sylvan, we discussed how contemporary art is somehow questioning the status quo of what we perceive as art and the fact that it doesn't necessarily have to be referring to a time, to a period of time, but is actually what art is um, meaning and how these is keep questioning what we're currently living uh, in terms of values we live by, for example. So Boris, I know that you've been experimenting also on social media and showing mm -hmm. art in different ways. How did that prove to you in terms of maintaining um, always an open mind and keep questioning the meaning of contemporary art? Well, yes, um, we, it's true that, uh, I mean, we have been following um, all kinds of different art artistic production since, since many years. And uh, uh, net art uh, is, is something that has been around since the beginning of the World Wide Web, at least. Um, but it's true that it's a niche that has been um, somehow been neglected by many um, uh, big institutions. And, and when we were in this situation where we had to participate in an exhibition because of the COVID, uh, we thought, what can we do? How can we also support the artists and give some little production help and maybe invite them to produce a work? And this is where we came with this idea of hack networks, which are very small commission to artists to um, to, to create a piece online, right? Um, but it can be anything. It can be a GIF. It can be um, can be a filter. Like I can create a filter for uh, Instagram for us uh, that people could use and, and post picture with this filter or videos. Um, Jonas Land created a beautiful piece where you could see the pointer when you visit our website. You could see the pointer 
uh, leaving traces of all the visitors that were in real uh, in real time visiting the same website our website. So and it created a kind of a dialogue. You could create a dialogue between the vi the visitors. So for us, it was a, a way of um, giving a, a platform and giving an open platform to the artists. Let them decide what they want to do. Let them decide how they want to engage with this platform, whether it's uh, Facebook, Instagram, whatever social media or website or whatever else. And uh, and it was exciting for us uh, to see how many creative ideas they, they will be able to come up with. And of course, uh, to come back to what you were saying, Silva, about the possibility of opening up new models uh, of, of exhibition online, like the Louvre being visited for free for the first three rooms and then paying for Sydney Astra room. I see this, this is a beautiful example of gamification of art, right? Because uh, the, a lot of video games today are free, but then you have to pay for extra content for, or if you will, or you can pay for some object, some aesthetic object, they say it's, it's never pay to win, they say, but, um, but it's a beautiful example how we can learn also from this model, economic models, and how can we integrate them if it makes sense for us or not. Um, I'm more interested in, 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 the, in the way artists can infiltrate this technology. How can they use these different strategies in, in a way that, uh, that, that surprise us? I totally agree. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think what you described, Sylvain, is definitely an interesting new model that most museums should be very much interested in applying towards that collection and the way we're going to be engaging with uh, the audience in the future. Um, COVID has really put a lot of us in a very challenging and uneasy uh, position. But I feel in a way it also brought us to see more opportunities and expand to new technologies that can be applied to engage with art in a more meaningful way. So actually, I would like to, to ask you all, would you think that such model can be applied within your own projects, such as the collection, the gallery, and an art fair? Would you be open to sort of experiment on such models? Maybe uh, if I need an answer on, on, on this one. Uh, what is that, which model are you yeah. talking about? Sorry, I, I didn't catch that uh, concept. Sure. So the model that something, for example, can be accessed for free and then there mm -hmm. are features that can ah, all right. be this model we're talking about. Uh, a paid uh, subscription or a membership, mm -hmm. um, simply because, as Sylvain described, most museums will struggle to survive after these uh, COVID-19. And we've seen uh, national museums being closed for now several months, and this is definitely proving uh, a challenging position for most government to keep supporting the arts and culture sector. So it was interesting to know from you how you're approaching these with your cultural organizations, collections, fairs, and, and galleries, and how these could be, for example, applied towards your, your current models. I hope that's more clear. Funny. Yeah, I mean, I think on the on the business model side, it's a it's a it's a real question. I mean, I, I would say before I go into into that part, I think also having this new technology and 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 what we experimented with CADAF is that we label ourselves as an art fair, right? Like, I mean, you have to label things for people to know uh, what to expect. However, we actually, with the technology, uh, and maybe we should have realized it in person, but with the technology, we realized that we can go way beyond just partnering with galleries. And obviously we were partnering with artists because there are a lot of digital artists who don't have representation. Uh, but beyond that, uh, we can partner with other art fairs to show their preview uh, on, on the platform. We can partner with auction houses to show uh, preview or sales results. We can partner with, um, well, we, we partner with Mana Contemporary for showing their open studios. And, and when you think about it, it's, it's a new type of event, right? Even before talking about the business model, uh, it's a new type of event. So I think for us, and I'm going to be very honest <laughs> with you, Serena, like it was, the goal was to do this experiment uh, this weekend, survive it and then iterate from it. So I don't have a definite answer on like the business model. What I've been, however, looking at um, and doing, even before COVID-19, is more like these new ways uh, to fund artist projects, commission them by uh, institutions and, and, and artist communes, pretty much organizing themselves with 
this decentralized blockchain technology. Again, I don't think this is a panacea, or I don't know if you say that in English, like panacea, which is the ideal solution for everything in French, um, but this is where it's a lot of, it's very interesting. And, and, and I know like I've been uh, talking to this uh, collective called Trojan Dao, uh, which is a collective of, uh, of Greek artists. And even before COVID, everything happened with the financial crisis in Greece. They said, there is no way that the government is gonna help us in the next 10 years. So let's not wait for that. Let's organize ourselves and like uh, find a way to uh, get funds, uh, get a decision-making system uh, to decide on the right projects and like the right governance. And this is what like the acronym DAO, like Decentralized Autonomous Organization, which is neither a decentralized autonomous or an organization, um, but this is kind of what they're trying to, um, to achieve. Again, it's still very niche because it can only apply to people within the crypto industry so not the um, um you know like end result but i think this is like where this is very interesting to uh to look at this but i have no answer on on your question actually <laughs> And, and and do you feel do you all feel that the online version of the IRL will remain very much present after these lockdown periods? And that's a question open to all all of you to answer. I know Sylvain, the DSL collection has been very much present online for quite a long time, but in a way, do you feel that the physicality going back into museums since we are now more aware about new ways of engaging with art will still remain and become a, a persistent model that will accompany the physicality of exhibitions for example you know once again to be online for me is not just about putting works online i think this is something important for us to be online also is to become a platform of idea is to be very strongly related to community to try to find the new thinkers it's not just about trying to create an experience of an artwork i think to be online opens a lot of doors on how to uh, interact with the people not just only about i shall say visual experience but also how you can bring people to become part of a new way of thinking and i think this is something which is also very important Coming back to what you said about the models, I think that uh, what is sure is that the, the present model of how the museums are financed is not, is not going to, 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 to last for a long time. I think there is a real, real uh, survival problem for many, many museums. Uh, everything is questioned in museum, the patrons, the funds, everything is questioned and now uh, the, the, the number of people coming inside. So I think it, it's a really, uh, it, it's a crucial problem. And so they have to find solutions. And uh, the only way to find solution is to try to attract new types of, I shall say, new tracks, new types of uh, audience, and to make them enough interesting for the audience to pay for that. That's very simple. Uh, if they can do it, uh, the, the, they will have millions and millions of people and they can have a very good way to make the, the offline, which is the most important thing, survive. If not capable, they will disappear. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's, for me, it's what happened today is, uh, is, is clear after this, this crisis is that the model cannot be the same after this crisis mm -hmm. well yes yeah, we'll if, 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 challenges um, with the uh, sustainability of projects and boris what what are your thoughts about this i i agree completely with sylvain that uh, we need to continuously um, rethink ourselves and uh, and we cannot just sit and and uh, and think that every everything will continue the way we know uh, but this is this is always true right not only for the situation today I don't see it as a dichotomy. I don't see it online versus real life as being one excluding each other. I think it both have been existing already since many years. Um, people have been online and offline and in real life and out and in and, uh, and also communicating and, and shifting easily between the two. So I think this will continue. 
I don't think the museum will close and uh, everything will be online. I think that there is still room for uh, physical uh, works and physical encounters. Uh, but yes, I think online will be more and more present. Uh, I agree with Sylvain that it should be also not just a bad copy of the real life, but uh, should also be um, created on the online space. The online experience should be created in a, in, in a way that it's uh, um, creative and, um, and meaningful for, for, the, for, for the digital uh, form itself. I also, for us, just to be a bit more specific, we created this series, Hack Networks, and we will continue it. So it's it's something that we started during the quarantine, but we decided to pursue and to continue um, indef indefinitely uh, for the next month. And we are even uh, thinking about new projects that we can do online. Uh, we have created one, uh, we're applying for fundings as well, and uh, we hope that it will be realized so we are continuing. Uh, so for us, it was a very positive experience and we will continue it for sure. But again, we will also continue our uh, exhibition program in our space. Um, and again, uh, one does not exclude the other one. What is interesting in maybe also spaces for communication between the two, uh, two spaces. Yeah, I think this is kind of going back to my hybrid version of, of this. This is kind of where uh, we need to strive toward that and everybody who is going to be stuck in one or the other are not going to um, you know, be sustainable in any industry really because now you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Maybe you have to turn off the in-person uh, and go fully online uh, or, um, you know, or, or, or be more loose and, and having a... You, you have to be agile between the two uh, spaces. I think this is like... Um, and do you see the next edition of Kadaf being present online and offline at the same time, Fanny? Yeah, so I, I really, I really, um, uh, for that, this is kind of where I'm, uh, you know, Carla uh, from Lumen Price was actually telling us about her exhibition that we op opened a few weeks ago. And, and, and that is like a, a bit more local exhibition uh, with a better uh, embedded technology for other people to follow. And, and for me, this is like the ideal future. It's like, it's something in person, but not like where like, 5,000 or like 10,000 people or 30,000 people like travel to because even for our planet, this is not, or our budget, this is not sustainable. And that like you have more local events um, uh, augmented with uh, better technology. So, um, so yeah, we still have, uh, like or the next on the roadmap is still Kadaf Paris. So I really, I really hope we, uh, we make that happen. And, uh, and Jean-Baptiste from Bozar is, uh, is all for it so there yeah no no reason why <laughs> that's wonderful to hear since we've approached uh nearly the end of our conversation for today i wanted to um conclude by asking everyone a very simple question that somehow can summarize our thoughts about the gamification of art and this will be how can still art be relevant when it's put into a virtual environment i know we discussed this extensively and there was much food for thoughts in this conversation. But if you were going to summarize in, in a sentence or two, what that means to you, what would that be? And maybe we can start from Sylvan going around. You know, uh, first, you know, what we're doing is that, uh, you know, we are a collector. We are not working for the uh, hardware industry. We are not working for a, a digital company uh, creating uh, video games or creating anything. We we just think that we can bring humanism into uh, digital, and uh, and we can think we do think that if we want to speak the language of our time and to reach the people of our time, especially the young people and the millennial, we have to find the right balance where. Uh, it's, uh, as I said to you, seriously fun. Uh, and we have to try to open new doors. I don't know what we will find in the new doors, behind the new door, but I think that we have to move with our time and not just to look at the past and to try always to run after the future. And this is what the museums are always doing. They have been always trying to run after the future. They've discovered the online when today we are at something different, because we are not just about putting something online. We have to work on something much more complex, which is how you bring a, a, a real 
real content relevant for people, which is not just to go online. And if you look at museum, uh, the, 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 uh, the amount which is uh, given to the marketing, digital marketing persons or the digital team is so weak uh, that you, 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 it, they will not, it, if they don't change the way they look at things, they will always be, look, I shall say, really, uh, you know, uh, running after the, the future. And we would try to, to, to be as much as we can moving, that's it. Thank you so much for sharing your vision, you Silvan, so which uh, I very much agree with. Thank you. And Boris, what that means for you, if you were going mm -hmm. to summarize in a... Absolutely. No, I don't think there is a, a formula that can be applied to, to, to define what is relevant in a, in a, for a digital artwork, you know, and this is true online or offline. Every work of art is relevant for the way it approaches some topics, the way it creates new aesthetics, it, it asks new questions. So, and this is true whether it's a sculpture, a painting, or a, or a work of virtual reality. So what, what makes the work relevant is, is, the is the specificity of the work itself and, and, and how it engages with the audience. Uh, for example, there's a, an artist, Cassie McQuarter, who creates a beautiful, very low five works of, of games, uh, interactive games. She created, for example, a dungeon crawler where uh, it subverts completely the, the, the laws and the, and the dynamics of the typical game, the dungeon crawler. And at, at the same time, she approaches um, topic related to gender questions and uh, the image of the woman online and so on and so on. And so this is how, this is why the work is relevant and not uh, because uh, it is simply a game or, or simply because it follows some uh, some formulas that, uh, that makes the world relevant or not. So I think, um, and this is the beauty of art, right? Every work is individual, it's, it's unique. And um, I think this is, um, this is something that needs to be respected as well um, in, in, uh, in, in the way we deal with her. Always have this, um, Sylvain, you mentioned this open door. I like this metaphor. Every time you engage with a work of art, you open a new door and you don't know what's on the other side. And that's the beauty of it, I think. Oh my God, that's perfect segue uh, to uh, what I was going to say. So awesome. It's, it's not like we repeated it, we, we, we rehearsed it, but I, I have one thing to say is like bring back, bring back the fun uh, in the narrative. You know, it's all about the story of the work and even more with digital art. Like I always said, online like is the trickiest place to actually uh, fully grasp the depths of digital art. Uh, with a painting, you have a, a you know emotional reaction, like something physical. With something digital, looking at like just like a small thing, like piece of of you know of 2D image, makes nothing. Uh, like you need to bring back the narratives, the stories, and and for me, this is where the fun is. You know, it's like we don't have to like I never played video game, but it's like when I tell the stories of these artists. And I see the person who's not from the art world like light up or even online chat being like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is, this is a win for me because it's like, I'm sorry to use the like, corporate term, but it's, it's true. It's like you explain something that somebody understood and found interesting. So Definitely keeping an open That's mind it. towards technologies and uh, how we can engage with new audiences on a global scale is definitely something we should all be more mindful about, uh, especially during this lockdown period. Uh, Boris, just a couple of words before we conclude about your new show that I know you've been working on. Can you tell us a bit more about it when these opens and what we can expect? Well, we have different shows coming up. Uh, so the next one is about uh, feelings and emotion curated by Sabine Himmelsbach. And then we will have in, the, in January a show on, on counter cartography uh, called The Shaping the Invisible World. There will be some interactive pieces as well in this, in this show. And then, as I mentioned it to you before, I'm working on a, on a show that engages with artists uh, using uh, video games. And this is going to be in summer next year. Um, I cannot tell you much more because I'm still prospecting artists. I have um, a list of uh, 30, 40 artists already. Uh, there is uh, a lot of them. I'm still making the final selection, uh, and uh, but for sure, uh, I'm very much interested in uh, in strategies of um, creating uh, works and, and interactive games uh, that do uh, subvert somehow the medium itself. This is definitely something that I'm interested in, or uh, some parasitic intervention within gaming environments, for example. Um, 
I'm happy to tell you more about it uh, once I made a, a final selection. But uh, for the moment, uh, I could mention a couple of names. I think uh, I already mentioned Cassie McWhorter, for example. That's uh, an artist I haven't spoke to her yet, but I'm definitely um, keeping an eye. But you also, Sylvain, you mentioned uh, many artists uh, that you have in your collection that, uh, that are engaged with video game, Feng Meng Bu, for example. There are many other Chinese artists as well that are interested. Yan Cheng, for example, has been working with video game for many many years. Um, I saw a work by Tian Xiao Lei that is also quite interesting. Um, uh, he has been doing some, some video games, um, very political. So there is, there is a lot, there is really a lot. And um, yes, I think it's an exciting, uh, an exciting uh, field to discover. Thank you so much, Boris. And Sylvain, we're very much eager to see your new video game for the DSL collection. To what? To tell you the truth, I don't know what, what, we, what it will be. I hope can, you I reveal, will. can you reveal something to us? Uh, yes, the only thing I can reveal is uh, it will be very interesting the way it will be done. First, it's done by people who are living in Hong Kong and Shenzhen. Mm -hmm. and, and I've asked them something is to, uh, to document the process. It will take six months, but from the next month, we'll have a blog and they will document the whole process of creating the work. Uh, so uh, what will be very interesting is, uh, and we will collect the work, uh, the work will be put on platform also, uh, and uh, we will collect the work and all the process. And uh, so I, I think it will be interesting to see uh, the, the, the process of how they create the work. And, uh, and I'm very, very curious uh, to, to, I shall say, to have this experience of, of an art of work of a video game being uh, documented from the beginning and and the way they they have created the uh the, this so next month you will have more news on that fantastic and we will be can't wait the news. <laughs> all right it's been a great pleasure to be talking to all of you Thanks. and i wish for all of us to continue this conversation hopefully in real life very soon and yes, let's keep an open mind towards technologies and the future of gamification in art. Once again, Boris, Sylvan, Fanny, thank you so much for this lovely conversation. And I'll speak to you soon. Thank you, Serena. Thank you, Serena. Pleasure. Thank you. Merci tout le monde. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.